most of us would give our employer two weeks notice before we left and went on to a different job or a different opportunity. Some of us are a little bit more flamboyant, however. I remember perhaps a couple years ago now, an airplane steward was uh, upset with his employer and uh, there on board the plane he uh, launched into a, a tirade against the, the airline and then he grabbed a couple of beers in his hand and opened up the uh, escape hatch let down the slide and slid up out on his way uh, off in the wild blue yonder. Uh, that caught everyone's fancy and uh, he became something of an overnight hero. Another gentleman is probably not a hero, or some. Uh, Mr. Jeff Smith uh, decided to leave his banking firm, Goldman Sachs, the most prominent uh, banking firm in the United States of America, a firm that provides uh, many of the uh, leaders in our federal government and uh, is looked upon by many as uh, the standard of American banking. He wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, describing his dissatisfaction with the way that things have developed at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he asserted that Goldman Sachs is no longer looking after the well-being of their clients. Their only concern is for themselves, how they may make a profit. And he says, I sat in on business meetings and the whole conversation was not about the customer and the customer's needs, but rather uh, how we can make money off of the customer. And he said there was such a, a distaste for the customer, disrespect for the customer, that they described customers as puppets. You know, funny little furry puppets who don't know a thing about what they're doing. That's their view of their clients. Well, Goldman Sachs responded and said, we don't succeed unless our clients succeed and all that. But perhaps Mr. Smith touched on the corruption that's developing within the American business community, a concern to take advantage of opportunities and use deceitful means to achieve their ends. When you look at the financial marketplace over the last few years, you find that there were complex financial arrangements that even the most sophisticated mathematicians have a hard time figuring out. One wonders whether those kinds of arrangements are in the best interests of their customers. In any case, you're certainly familiar with the collapse of the banking system in 2008 here in the United States and the impact that that has had on us. When we were told that the banks were too big to fail and we need to step in and bail them out. The Prophet Mike has spoken a day which was similar to our own. There were foreclosures in the housing market. The market was collapsing. People were becoming in debt, in debt up to their ears. So much so that the uh, business community would hire uh, creditors to come after the, these uh, folks, and even if they're just walking down the street, minding their own business, they might take them aside and, and tell them, you owe us money, and then take whatever expensive clothing they might have off of them and leave them pitiless. It was a hard time in Judea. The rich were getting richer, the poor were struggling. The middle class was disappearing. And Micah the prophet stands up and speaks out against what he saw going on. Now mind you, his words against the business leaders in the second chapter are dealing with corrupt practices of business. There's not a problem with uh, proper business practices, getting a profit, earning a living for yourself, trying to prosper in the world, and serving your customers along the way. That's entirely appropriate. And it's good to be diligent in your business, to work hard, and to find ways in which you can enrich the community around you by producing a product or providing a service that will benefit others and also provide for your own needs as well. That is all commendable. But what Micah objects to is the kind of covetousness, the acquisitiveness that captured the hearts of many of the business leaders in the community 
who use their competitive advantage in the marketplace to uh, oppress the poor, or as a, 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 a business that I was once familiar with used to say, to crush the competition. Uh, there was an interest in advancing one's own uh, interests at the expense of others. And so Micah starts off in the second chapter with a, a strong word of God's wrath against this business community. Woe to you! This expression of woe is an expression uh, uh, of the wrath of God against those in the business community who conducted themselves in improper ways. Look at what they're doing, Micah says. When everybody else is in bed asleep, having pleasant dreams, resting, peaceful in the thought that their homes are secure, their family is provided for, all is well. Here are these business leaders sitting at home at night, and they are so preoccupied with the, 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 the thought of obtaining somebody else's property, that they are up all through the night. Calculating and considering and plotting and planning, trying to figure out a way to dispossess others, to remove their property from them, to acquire it using dishonest means, to defraud. And note, that's the emphasis here, the use of dishonest means, defrauding people through corrupt practices. These men are consumed by this effort. And while everybody else is asleep at night, they're up through the night calculating all these things, putting together plans and then plotting it out. It's a very detailed process they're going through here. They have their ideas, their objectives, they work out a plan, they write it all out, they have a plot in mind. By morning's night, they think they've got it all settled. It's all squared away. It's foolproof. It's foolproof. And at morning's light, they can't wait to put their plans into effect. They run out into the marketplace and they work their magic. They try to manipulate and control the market in such a way as to shift uh, the market and allow things to move in their direction. Micah is very upset with this and you can understand why. We see something of these kinds of practices in the business community today. Or typically business uh, leaders who uh, coordinate their activities with uh, government powers and authorities and use perhaps legislation, regulation, what have you, to further their own interests and needs. Sometimes laws of eminent domain are made use of to acquire properties that people have for the sake of other interests. It's supposed to be for the community interest. But sometimes somebody wants to build a golf course uh, where somebody has a, a home and a nice property. And so eminent domain laws are used to step in and remove that property and force their way into that uh, piece of property. Uh, think of estate taxes. Here is a, a way in which government uses to control families and to keep them from getting ahead. When families, uh, through God's prosperity and blessing, advance in life and uh, the folks pass on, they cannot leave their inheritance for their children, whether it be a farm or a property or, or, or a bank account, what have you, the government steps in and begins to take up to half of it, or perhaps even more, away. And this way the government shows, it's really, it's war against the family. It does not want strong, prosperous families that can keep the government in check. And so estate taxes are used to suppress, to defraud, to take that which is not properly theirs. There are many other ways in which this could be illustrated, but we see what takes place. The problem is that many in the business community think that their, their activities are amoral, or not having anything to do with religion. It's just business, they say. Don't take offense, it's just business. That's just the way it is. It's money. That's what happens. And so they go about their business in ways which have little regard for truth, morals, 
for love. It's just business. The prophet reminds the business community that their practices do not go beyond God's reach. They're not amoral, laissez-faire to God or to religion. They are uh, to be governed by the law of God. And that's why Micah begins with this uh, threat of woe, judgment. Judgment comes because you are responsible to conduct your business in ways that honor God, that reflect His standards, that don't steal and, and lie and all the rest of it. And so, Micah reminds them that they are accountable to the Lord for the way that they conduct their business. They didn't want to hear that. But it's true. The business leaders want to keep religion confined to the church services, the temple worship up there in Jerusalem. But through the rest of the week, they own the day. They own the night. They own the marketplace. Stay out. You just stay in your little church and talk about believing God and loving one another. And you'll be just fine. See, the business community sometimes doesn't want to hear that God's law speaks to the way they conduct their business. Or that they are accountable to the Lord Himself. There is a religious component to all of life. We do not escape our obligation or responsibility to God when we leave the, the doors of the temple or the church. All of life is to be lived before God. Every aspect of life comes under His review. And the business community needed to hear that. We need to be reminded of it as well. The scriptures speak to business matters. They challenge us when we are uh, pursuing men. When we make a God out of our money as opposed to worshiping the Lord our God. So the scriptures address all of life, including the business community. God says while the businessman is planning his own ways, God himself has a plan of his own. God, God's plans will come into effect. And Micah tells how God will take these people and plunder them in the way that they have attempted to plunder the poor and the weak and, the, and, and so forth. God would rectify matters and bring judgment on these who are in power. But Mike is not simply displeased with the business community and the way that it's conducted itself. Also the religious community. Those who, by their theology, by their preaching, by their teaching, uh, by their encouragements, become enablers for this kind of practice. Their theology, as it were, turns a blind eye to life in the world and just focuses on mythological matters, on things which are above. In the realm of grace, not in the realm of nature. And so the focus is all on things above. And a positive, optimistic message that people love to hear is what is on their tongues. God will prosper you. God will bless you. God loves you. Come into the church. And those who are prosperous come in and like to hear that, and they give and support that ministry. There's a kind of connection here between uh, this corrupt business community on the one hand, and the preachers, the pastors, who support them, enable it, who defend it. And when there's a Micah in the room who says, No! You can't be defrauding people or using dishonest means to advance yourself. Then these religious leaders say, what do you mean God is going to judge people? That's an archaic notion. That's something of the past. That's a mean idea. That's hateful speech. You can't speak like that. And so the Micahs of the world are tempted to be silenced by those in positions of religious power, occupying the fancy pulpits in the communities around the world, or in the, in the country. They say, don't prophesy of the, these sorts of things. Micah 
uses a little bit of sarcasm describing these fanciful preachers, these optimistic preachers. He says that it, you are the kinds of, of people who would love to have preachers who say you will have an abundance of beer and wine. <laughs> this is the, the, the prosperity preaching that uh, occupy, would occupy you. Somebody who would talk about all this worldly enjoyments and delights and pleasures. Speaking of all this wonderful stuff, but never speaking about God's justice. The offense he takes at sin and wickedness. How often do you hear from some of the popular TV preachers an attempt to expose the sin of people and to hold them accountable for their behaviors and their actions? How often do you hear that God wants to bless you and wants to prosper you in your work, in your home, and so forth, and just trust Him and it will go well for you? There need to be prophets like Micah who speak out and say certain kinds of behaviors are an offense to God. Now, scriptures support a free market. Scriptures support trade and advancing, and prospering in life. That's all good and to be encouraged. Remember, what Mike is speaking against here is manipulating the marketplace, using fraud and deceit to accomplish what you want. Isaiah talks about how they planned and plotted and then they achieved it. Why? Because it was in their power to do it. They monopolized the market. They had control of the various influences in the marketplace, whether government influences or media influences or whatever, and they used their competitive advantage in improper ways. That's what Micah was speaking against. Micah does not have simply a message of, of criticism against those who are in power. He also has a message of comfort for the people of God. He turns to the church, the remnant of God's people, and says that all is not lost. You may live in a community where there are strong, powerful economic interests that are against you. After all, when as, a script, as we are seeing in the book of Revelation, we will see, you have the powers, of the economic powers, that will defraud Christians and oppress Christians for their faith. You'll find later this morning how the Roman Empire would uh, oppress Christians in the early church if they did not acknowledge Caesar. Business opportunities would be removed from them. church needs to be encouraged that there is a God in heaven who will not be confined to the temple, not be confined to that heavenly temple, but he will exercise his judgment in the earth, and he will save and rescue his people. And Micah closes with an image of this great shepherd, this one whom he is going to speak of in the fifth chapter, the one who will be born from Bethlehem and rise up to be a ruler among his people. He speaks of none other than the Lord Jesus, who would rise up and shepherd his people, gather his people in the, into the fold, gather them into a place of safety and provision, gather them into his church. That is the work of the Spirit in this age, in this time. Christ is calling his people from all walks of life to come and to follow him, to enter into the fold of his church. And Christ promises that there will be a prosperous church, an abundant church. It will be a noisy place because of all the people who are gathered together there. What a wonderful vision Micah has here of the great church of the Lord Jesus Christ gathered, perhaps at the great eschatological event in history when we all gather before the Lord in glory and sing with a mighty shout of the glory of the Lord, crying out, worthy is the Lamb. This great thunderous Ovation to the Lord. Micah depicts that somewhat, but then he has this very unusual comment here that the one who gathers his people and brings them into the fold is the one who breaks the way before them and leads them out into the pastures. What is this breaking? 
You mean he's going to break through the church, destroy its walls, or something to that effect? Commentators are all over the map with regard to understanding what Micah is saying here, but it seems to me that what Micah is addressing is that the world would like to confine the church to that fold, confine the people of God to their churches and their little communities, and say, thus far, no further. You're okay when you're, fine, when you're behind your church walls, and you can have your worship, but don't step out into the marketplace. Don't step out into the public square. Don't step out into politics and express your views. Stay in your churches. Well, Micah says that the ruler of the church is not one who just sits back. He breaks through the oppression that the world would place upon his people. And he advances in history and time to call his people to himself. No matter what restrictions the government may place upon his people. You've got Iran trying to execute a Christian pastor for his faith in Jesus Christ. You have uh, Muslim communities attacking Christian churches in a variety of places around the world. And little is said about it. You have many Christians who are losing their jobs in different places because of their Christian faith or being criticized for what they have to say. The Lord Jesus will not be confined to the church walls. He will advance into all life. Every aspect of life comes under His review. And He will call His elect to Himself. We serve a mighty Savior who advances in history and time, accomplishing His purpose, bringing His elect home. So Micah challenges us to examine our ways and to see if our practices conform to God's Word. When we conduct our business, do we do it in such a way as to show love, care, consideration for our customers, taking care of their needs, making sure that they are well provided for, even if it means sometimes we don't get quite the profit that we might have hoped for. And it's not to say that we shouldn't get profit. You should receive a profit for your work. The laborer is worthy of his wages. Profit is good. But greed isn't good. I think of the movie that Michael Douglas starred in some time ago, Wall Street, and said, greed is good. No. Love is good. Love is capitalism. That's true capitalism. It cares for the poor and the needy by providing them goods and services that they can afford to help them improve their lives. That's good economics. And so God's Word challenges us to examine ourselves, our business practices, examine our churches, examine the preaching that we listen to. What are we hearing on the radio, on the TV? What do we hear in our churches? Is it just simply a positive, optimistic gospel that all is going to go well for you? Just trust God and you'll be blessed. Or is it a well-rounded gospel that addresses all of life? Bringing encouragements and hope. Giving guidance and direction. But also at times correcting and confronting. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It does pierce sometimes. It cuts. It hurts. But those who humble themselves before the word of the Lord and receive what he has to say will receive the blessing of salvation and everlasting life. And they will have a mighty one to lead them into the green pastures of God's provision. Trust in this one and he will bless you. All in good time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the prophet Micah who stood in a, a difficult uh, situation and spoke out and spoke clearly uh, with regard to uh, the standards of righteousness and with regard to the Lord who is in control. We pray that your blessing will be on us. Help us, Lord, to speak to our family members and friends and so forth about um, good and right economics and business practices, good and right preaching and teaching, 
And we pray that we would form a great contrast between that and the ways of this world, its corrupt and uh, deceitful practices. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen.